Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you from wherever you may be joining. Um, we welcome you to today's webinar on the Global Value Chain Development Report 2021 Beyond Production. My name is Leslie Behrman Lom, and I am the Asian Development Bank, or ADB, representative for North America based in Washington, D.C. While many of you are familiar with ADBs and its activities, before we start the presentation, I would like to provide a few words on what we do here at the ADB North American Representative Office, or NARA for short. Our main functions are to mobilize financing and support for ADB's developing member countries, share development knowledge and experience, establish and deepen partnerships with public, private, and nonprofit organizations in North America, and raise public awareness about ADB with our key stakeholders in Canada and the US. We encourage you to reach out to us if you have any questions about ADB's work beyond this briefing, and we're very happy to engage. And with that, I turn things over to Joey Gonzalez, who will introduce our moderator and speaker for today's event. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Hello, everyone. My name is Joey Gonzalez, and I'm a graduate student in the School of Foreign Service and the Business School at Georgetown University. I'm also the vice president of the Georgetown Anti-Poverty Society, an organization designed to connect graduate students with a variety of practitioners from the public, private, multilateral, and nonprofit sectors. We aim to support students' academic and professional development through skill building, networking, and discussion relating to event, events and issues of international development, just like with our event today. Joining me from the society is our president, Varsha Manan. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker and moderator today. Firstly, our speaker is Dr. Michael Green. Dr. Michael Green is Director of Asian Studies and the Chair in Modern and Contemporary Japanese Politics and Foreign Policy at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He's also a Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair at CSIS and previously served as Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and Senior Director for Asian Affairs at the National Security Council. Dr. Green speaks fluent Japanese and spent over five years in Japan working as a staff member on the National Diet. He has been on the faculty of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Um, we'll forgive him for that. He's a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, a staff member at the Institute for Defense Analyses, and a senior advisor to the Office of Asia Pacific Affairs in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. He's a trustee of the Asia Foundation, a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, a member of the Aspen Strategy Group and serves on the advisory boards of the Center for a New American S Security and Australian American Leadership Dialogue and the editorial board of the Washington Quarterly. Dr. Green, thank you for moderating our discussion today. Next up, I'll introduce our speaker. M. Joseph Maria Singham, joining us from Manila today is Senior Stat Statistician in Asian Development Bank's Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department. Joseph leads data development and statistical capacity building initiatives in the system of national accounts, global value chains, and statistical business registers. He started his career at Statistics Canada in 1999 and earned a bachelor's and a master's degree in economics from Queen's University, Canada. Joseph has considerable experience in producing critical data and analysis for evidence-based policymaking. Thank you both for joining us on the call this morning or this evening. I'm excited to hand it over to M. Joseph shortly to begin our presentation and discussion, but just before doing so, I would like to ask our audience members to please use the Q&A function to submit questions at any point during the discussion. Uh, Joseph, lovely to have you today. Thank you for calling in from Manila and the floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you very much, Joey, for this uh, kind introduction. And I would like to thank uh, the Georgetown University as well as the uh, ADB North America office for giving us this uh, facility to um, disseminate our work to a wider audience. Uh, so let me begin by uh, uh, giving a brief, brief introduction about this report. Uh, this is the uh, third of this kind. Uh, the first report was uh, produced in 2017, the second one in 2019. Uh, each time we focused on issues that were pertinent to the, the times uh, and then the issues that were related to global value chains. Uh, right? And at this time, um, given the times, uh, given um, the issues that we are dealing with, uh, the, the, the report deals with uh, deals with a number of issues. Uh, first, of course, we look at the uh, global value chain trends over the last 20, 25 years. Uh, that would be the first chapter. And then the, over the, the next uh, five chapters, uh, we look at uh, various issues such as uh, various uh, phenomena, such as uh, innovation, um, 
uh, intellectual property, uh, foreign direct investment, uh, productivity, uh, COVID-19, trade war, uh, and digitalization, and, and so on. Uh, so all issues that are pertinent uh, to the situation that uh, we are facing today. So with that, uh, I will move on to uh, make the presentation. Uh, given the constraints of time, uh, we will focus mainly on the trends uh, that we see in global value chain in the, we have been seeing in the global value chain over the last 20 years, plus some discussion on the current issues related to uh, the production uh, uh, supply chain issues and, uh, and so on. Thanks. Okay. Um, speaking of uh, the trends in global value chain, what we have seen over the last 20 years is a sort of a, a two stage uh, evolution of the global value chain. The first stage uh, is sort of a, a, a 25 year period uh, starting in the uh, late uh, 80s, early 90s over uh, to about the mid uh, to about 2010 up until the, uh, the time of global financial crisis. Uh, during this period, um, what we witnessed is um, a rapid increase in globalization, uh, rapid, uh, rapid uh, growth in uh, global production networks, uh, what we refer to as global value chains. Uh, and uh, we see the evidence of it uh, using various methods, uh, two of which are we, uh, we uh, labeled here, uh, the details are in the report. Um, now, the, uh, this phenomena, this rapid increase in global value chain over this 25 year period is uh, often uh, referred to as the uh, hyper globalization period. Uh, there are good reasons uh, for this kind of rapid growth uh, that, uh, that we see here. Uh, one uh, is uh, essentially the, uh, the geopolitical uh, situation, evolving uh, geopolitical situation uh, during that period. Uh, as you know, uh, China opened up, India uh, became more and more engaged uh, with the global economy. There were uh, Eastern Europe uh, becoming more integrated into the, uh, the, into the world. Uh, e political issues uh, with, China, with the United, uh, Soviet Union and, and so on. And plus, of course, uh, rapid uh, development related to technology, uh, internet, uh, smartphones, uh, many of the technologies that we know uh, either uh, were developed or uh, they became uh, into popular use uh, during that period, uh, including, uh, you know, the, the platform economy that we use uh, now. So, uh, uh, prevalently uh, was initially developed in, uh, in, 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 in the 2000, uh, but it could not catch on to, uh, because of the lack of demand. Uh, so now, uh, so, so over that 25-year uh, period, there was a rapid uh, uh, growth in um, uh, global value chain or uh, global production networks, but then um, as we hit the, uh, the, the, the period during uh, global financial crisis, the demand dropped, uh, obviously. Uh, uh, there was a lull in the, uh, the, the, the growth in the global value chain. Uh, however, uh, again, um, uh, this was uh, largely due to the, the drop in demand. The decline was uh, largely due to the drop in demand. Uh, then uh, after... Uh, you know, as uh, the, the, the world recovered from the global financial crisis, there was a rapid increase, uh, sort of a catch, catching up uh, to the, uh, so that the, 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 the global value chain participation reached uh, the level of the uh, pre-GFC uh, period. Uh, however, after that, what we saw was either a stagnation or a uh, sort of a decline in the uh, global value chain participation. Uh, this may be uh, due to a uh, number of factors. One is uh, having seen uh, the supply uh, disruptions and, and so on due to and their demand uh, falling uh, due to the global financial crisis. Uh, countries as well as uh, firms uh, may have started to look into uh, reshoring or nearshoring and bring, uh, bring back uh, uh, localized production processes and so on. That's one. Uh, the other uh, could be the fact that, uh, you know, over the period, 
uh, there are various factors that uh, propel uh, the growth of global value chain that includes uh, the, the, the factor advantages specific locations have. All the economic advantages may have already been uh, maximized or utilized given the geopolitical situation at the policy framework and the technology and so on. So there may not have been uh, room for uh, further growth in uh, global value chains. Uh, however, uh, what uh, we see is uh, since 2016, uh, then there was another period of uh, rapid growth. So, so it may have been uh, due to uh, uh, the the onset of the the Trump administration because there have been talks of uh, there have been uh, discussions about uh, uh, increasing uh, imposing tariffs and uh, in impending trade war and so on so to before the tariffs could hit uh, proposed tariffs or the uh, tariffs could hit uh, uh, the firms may have uh, made the decision to uh, uh, engage in um, increased activity imports exports uh, just so that they can meet the tariff so that uh, that's why both in terms of uh, gross exports uh, gross trade as well as gvc participation levels we see uh, uh, a spike around 2018 and then of course um, uh, by 28 after 2018 uh, many of that uh, the tariffs uh, uh, both by the U.S. administration and also the retali retaliatory measures by the People's Republic of China came into effect. And as a result, uh, then uh, we saw a uh, drop in um, uh, GVC participation rates. And now, of course, uh, we are facing the pandemic and uh, uh, because of COVID-19, uh, both uh, trade dropped as well as the GVC participation drop. So that's essentially the story of this chart. Now, uh, looking at pure numbers, um, so we look at, we analyze the situation uh, both in terms of uh, gross exports, uh, which is the traditional trade uh, statistics, and also in terms of what we call indirect export. It's like a, a trade in value added measure uh, explained in detail in the um, in their report. What we see is uh, we look at two periods. One is uh, the 10-year uh, period between 2000 and uh, give me this. Okay, a 10-year period between uh, 2000 and 2010 and another almost a 10-year period between uh, 2010 and 2019. So uh, looking at both measures, what we see is uh, so in the first 10-year period, the growth uh, has been uh, rather uh, significant and sort of uh, dampened in the, the, the second 10 year period. And uh, looking at the major uh, traders, uh, major exporting countries by uh, uh, indirect export measure, uh, what we see is uh, again, uh, the, the same pattern repeats uh, across the major uh, exporters. Uh, you may be surprised to see Germany as being a may, uh, be the number one exporter, both in uh, you know since basically 2010, uh, as per the indirect export measure, uh, simply because a German uh, Germany is engaged in a high value production uh, in the production of high value machinery and equipment and so on. Uh, so that's why they have a high. Uh, they are leading in indirect uh, exports. Uh, another. Uh, so what we see is across the board, uh, we see a, dec uh, a declining uh, growth rate, uh, most significant uh, decline in the growth rate that you can see is for uh, the People's Republic of China, which uh, whose rate, uh, uh, you know, the growth was 20% uh, from 2000 to 2010, but it declined to about uh, four, almost 5%. Uh, that that's uh, related to uh, that's due to a whole host of factors, including uh, China uh, starting to look uh, more uh, domestically uh, for uh, growing its economy, and of course also related to other factors uh, such as the trade war and so on. Uh, a surprise here may be uh, Netherlands uh, being there, even though it's a small economy. Uh, it's indirect uh, exports uh, measured as a uh, as a TVA measure, trade and value added measure, is quite high because of the uh, specific products it trades in. Um, all right. In terms of uh, countries that 
in, in during this period in terms of countries that uh, increase their uh, gvc participation quite rap rapidly um we can uh, you know, Nepal, for example, uh, it's it's uh, more of a base effect because they started from a very low base, so, so they you know any re any significant increase could be uh, could translate into a very high percentage increase. Uh, for uh, Mongolia, uh, Mongolia is uh, a neighbor uh, of China, and uh, what uh, we see is. Uh, you know they pr produce and provide raw materials uh, for uh, Chinese uh, manufacturers. However, they started to um, integrate uh, and localize uh, some of the uh, production processes that were uh, in China, uh, and then they brought to Mongolia. So they started to increase the GVC participation. Uh, for Cambodia and Laos. Uh, what has happened is uh, as Chinese uh, labor uh, costs uh, start to increase and start to match its productivity, uh, ch Chinese firms uh, start to move to uh, Cambodia and Laos and set up factories, especially, especially in uh, low-tech manufacturing such as text textiles and so on. Uh, and again, uh, both Cambodia and Laos are also uh, neighbors of China, and it was uh, also easier for Chinese firms to uh, set up uh, facilities in Cambodia and Laos. Uh, in fact, uh, now the trend is uh, for the textile factories to move uh, to move from Cambodia and Laos, even like to African countries like Ethiopia and Kenya, because uh, not only because the labor uh, costs are lower there. Uh, in the African countries, but also because uh, proximity to the markets, the European markets. Uh, Vietnam uh, is one country where, uh, which has the infrastructure, which has developed the infrastructure to absorb um, uh, low to medium tech uh, production processes uh, moving out of China for economic reasons. This is even before the trade conflict hit. Uh, however, um, as soon as the uh, conflict hit and uh, the United States uh, started to impose tariffs on, on a variety of Chinese uh, Chinese uh, produced products, um, a number of uh, so any production process that could easily move from China uh, uh, had like some production processes moved from China to Vietnam and uh, Vietnam was seen as the number one beneficiary of that movement. And uh, along with uh, Vietnam, we also uh, uh, saw um, uh, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, uh, and uh, Taipei, China as benefiting from uh, the trade conflict uh, because production process, they had the uh, technological infrastructure to absorb uh, any uh, production moving out of China uh, to another country that will not be subject to uh, tariffs. Now, another way of uh, looking at uh, uh, the uh, the GVC is to look at uh, the, 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 the global production network is to look at uh, given production uh, uh, chains um, length. Oh, so the, the length is composed of various stages and as um, the technology enables the, the product to be, uh, the production process to be fragmented, the, the, the length uh, becomes longer. Right? The production chain becomes longer and there will be multiple uh, and more fragmented stages and based on a given locations, uh, the location means it can be around the world. Uh, the uh, advantage, uh, location specific advantage, uh, companies, uh, multinational companies, uh, corporations, firms can locate the production process uh, around the world to, to gain maximum benefit uh, from uh, the globally distributed production processes. So uh, minimize cost and maximize profit. Now, what we see is that uh, between uh, 2000 and 2010, uh, across sectors, uh, across most sectors, the production processes uh, have been uh, uh, increasing in length. That means multiple stages uh, and multiple stages, not only multiple stages, but also the fragmented processes being located in, um, in various locations around the world. However, in the second 10 period that we, 10-year uh, period that we uh, look at, uh, basically, uh, 
the, the lengthening process has also stagnated, which means uh, given the technology and uh, given the uh, location specific uh, economic advantage, um, the firms have already reached a saturation point uh, by uh, say 2010. And there isn't much, there isn't much more to do in term, given the limits of technology in terms of uh, lengthening the production process and gaining uh, additional uh, economic benefit. So uh, the globalization that we saw earlier uh, uh, in the first chart uh, could, could very well be attributable uh, uh, you know, largely, could very well, not necessarily largely, but uh, to a significant uh, part to the limits of technology. Uh, another school of thought uh, uh, is that um, because uh, we do not, because the way we calculate, uh, we measure uh, ex uh, exports, uh, whether it's gross exports or GVC exports, uh, we base the measure on the system of national accounts concepts, uh, which means uh, a good uh, service uh, has to cross the border to be uh, considered uh, as uh, you know import or export. Um, uh, the one school of thought is that we are probably underestimating the contribution of uh, GVC trade to overall trade, uh, simply because we are not con considering in our measure the uh, the the sale or the 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 contribution of or the sale of. Um, a foreign, in, uh, yeah, foreign affiliate uh, look, uh, located in a given country selling to uh, or trading with a local uh, a domestic firm. Um, uh, in, in national accounts, uh, it would be considered as a local trade rather than an uh, international trade. But um, as per some school of thought that uh, we could be underestimating the contribution of value chain trade because of, of that trade not being counted in. So uh, we uh, looked at the data and we uh, tried, we integrated that trade into the uh, into the calculations and saw how things would uh, look. Uh, yes, uh, if we uh, include uh, the uh, what we call the FDI trade, basically the trade between uh, foreign affiliate located in the country and uh, a local uh, or a domestic firm. Uh, if we include that as a GVC trade in the calculation of GVC trade, uh, the GVC participation rate, what we see is the uh, GVC participation rate essentially doubling uh, across the years. However, it does not uh, change the trend uh, that we saw earlier, both in terms of you know, uh, hyper uh, globalization and, and globalization. So uh, it might change the levels, uh, but, but not the trend. So uh, another, uh, so, uh, so we were investigating further into the causes of this globalization. So, yeah, so we looked at the, 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 the production processes reaching their technological limits. And uh, we also looked at whether we are uh, no, not, uh, whether we are, uh, missing some uh, GVC trade, uh, which also we looked at uh, by including the FDI trade in the calculation and, 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 and then coming out with the uh, same result. So we also looked at, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the phenomena, which we call regionalism, whereby a group of countries with geographical proximity get together, form an agreement to trade among themselves uh, with preferential treatments within the group, uh, so uh, whether that could be causing uh, globalization. So uh, first we looked at the number of uh, regional trade agreements. Uh, as you can see, the number of regional trade agreements have been going up uh, over the years. And then especially since 1990s, it has gone up quite dramatically. And so this is the cumulative, num uh, cumulative uh, number of uh, trade agreements, regional trade ag agreements. Then on an year by year basis too, uh, we see the trade agreements, uh, you know, new trade agreements being, regional trade agreements being uh, uh, implemented or 
were coming into effect. Uh, but we also see in keeping with the times, the trade agreements not only cover uh, goods, uh, but also services. So there is, uh, there is indeed, uh, you know, um, uh, movement towards uh, more and more uh, regional trade agreements, uh, but we would we wanted to see what effect this has on the globalization phenomena. So we looked at uh, uh, four uh, well established uh, regional uh, enclaves uh, with. Um, well-defined agreements. Uh, so one is the ASEAN. ASEAN uh, plus three is all the ASEAN countries. The three would be China, um, uh, Korea, and Japan. EAEU, uh, which is a Eurasian, e e Eurasian Union, which includes uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, uh, Russia, Belarus, and Armenia. EU 28, uh, and then of course, uh, NAFTA. Um, what we did was we constructed a measure by which we compared intra-regional trade uh, with uh, a tr trade of that region uh, with the, outside of the region. And uh, the higher the index, uh, the greater the trade, uh, the higher the index, the greater the intra-regional trade. So what we see is uh, essentially uh, the NAFTA region, which is uh, North America. So basically Canada, United States, and uh, comprising of Canada, United States, and Mexico, uh, trading a lot more internally than uh, you know, other regions, right? Um, um, and uh, it, uh, NAFTA is one agreement which worked out very well as a complement with each country being a complement to the other with uh, Canada having the resources, uh, United States having the technological and manufacturing and research base and, uh, and um, uh, Mexico providing the, uh, the low cost labor for assembly and so on. So it was a, uh, an agreement that was, uh, that produced very good overall results. It is even more uh, complementary um, uh, compared to uh, the, the European Union, which is the red line. Uh, however, uh, and again, uh, when you look at the Eurasian, um, uh, the intra uh, EAU trade is is quite low, simply because their 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 economies are not so diversified. They are mostly uh, dependent on um, raw materials, uh, resources, uh, primary resources. Right? Uh, so they do not have much to trade with each other. So, uh, so I, we will. I'll show you in another chart later on that they depend a lot on uh, imports and exports. But uh, even looking at this uh, uh, regional uh, cooperation uh, index, uh, what we see is that uh, it has been pretty stable over the years. And um, again, uh, the drop here, especially that we see in, in NAFTA is uh, largely because of NAFTA being renegotiated um, after 2016, uh, uh, when the new administration took over. Um, and then the increase uh, here that you see for ASEAN is uh, largely because of the trade conflict kicking in. And uh, as a result of that, there was uh, more uh, trade uh, within uh, ASEAN countries, uh, ASEAN plus three that includes China. So again, uh, what we again what we see here is that even with this uh, increasing uh, trend uh, in um, intra-regional trade, um, that did not really contribute much to this globalization. Now. Uh, Speaking of uh, regionalism, uh, we thought we would look further uh, into the, uh, the production processes of each region to see whether uh, there is uh, room for them to be, to, to, to have further uh, intra-regional trade. So uh, the, the first region we looked at is, uh, is ASEAN. Uh, and, um, what 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 we see here is that um, um, so if you look at this chart um, on the basically the the red part plus the uh, blue part uh, gives you the total output of any given sector. So here it's agriculture. The total output of agriculture is given by the red plus the blue. And uh, now. 
if it if the blue is uh, close to 100%, which means the domestic demand is being met by domestic production. And uh, if not, uh, then if the red is uh, further down, then uh, the domestic demand needs to be met. You need to import to meet, meet the domestic demand. Now, um, in many cases, uh, in the cases of many sectors, what we see is that um, um, a domestic demand could be met by um, uh, domestic production. Uh, however, if countries want to produce more to export, they would have, to, when they want to expand production, they have to depend on imports. Uh, so their dependency on, on imports uh, uh, is is quite large and uh, and uh, it is also across across sectors, you know, considering both agriculture, manufacturing, and even services. And we did the same exercise uh, for all the uh, other regions. So this is the EAU region, where which is primarily whose dependence is on the primary sector, which is. Uh, resources such as crude oil and, and and metals and so on. And again, when you look at their manufacturing sector, you can see uh, many of these sectors are dependent on, on, on the imports, right? And even service sector, uh, they are self-sufficient in the sense that they can meet their demands, but if they want to uh, develop further and export, they have to start uh, depending on imports. And the next one is um, this is uh, sorry. This one is uh, European Union, and uh, again uh, in European Union, um, as you can see, a lot of its GDP uh, depends on services, and even in services, when they even though they are self-sufficient, uh, to in the sense they their local production can meet local demand, uh, for them to develop further and export, uh, they will have to uh, import first. And their uh, manufacturing, uh, which is um, whose contribution is lower to contribution to GDP is lower compared to the its service sector. Uh, still, again, uh, it depends on uh, heavily on on imports. An interesting one here is the uh, the the NAFTA region. Uh, a huge portion of its GDP is composed of services. And uh, even though much of his services don't uh, depend on imports, uh, in, the manufacturing base uh, still depends on uh, imports. Uh, so uh, the so the, this analysis shows the interdependencies, uh, the global interdependencies, intra interregional interdependencies, and uh, so um, what it uh, also shows is that for further economic development, uh, they will have to trade more, import more, and export more. And even though they may be able to uh, meet their own uh, uh, local demand for further development, they will have to trade more. Uh, another uh, index uh, that we looked at was the, what is called the localization or, or the agglomeration index. Uh, so one of the, um, issues that we were looking at, the phenomena that we were looking at is, was whether uh, the, because of various uh, global issues, so trade war, uh, weather, uh, geopolitical issues, even pandemic, um, uh, and even uh, changes in technology, uh, which enable firms to uh, basically bring back production, automate production, and uh, bring back production to uh, a, a closer, uh, geographically closer place to the market. Uh, was the so we looked at what is called the localization index, where which basically measures um, the from both a uh, backward and a forward perspective. So from a backward perspective, uh, from a, if the, the value added of the production processes that are the, the, the production processes backward to a given stage of production in a country are increasing, then we call it reshoring. Basically, instead of importing the intermediate input necessary to produce, 
that country is now producing their intermediate input locally. So that's what we call reshoring. Now, um, in the period that we uh, looked at from 2000 to 2010 and 2010 to 2020, um, except maybe for United States, uh, in, the, in the first period, we didn't see any noticeable reshoring. And it is probably, and again, the United States, is, the, the trend in the United States is probably because of the, the high value adding products uh, that it is producing. Uh, because it is a value added measure. Uh, so the, the limited number of reshoring that may have happened uh, could actually have been really high value adding production processes. So that may have uh, uh, influenced or uh, directed this uh, measure. But other than that, um, most countries stayed within the uh, low agglomeration um, uh, uh, index area, which means uh, a lot of the intermediate inputs were imported and much of the products the countries produced were exported. Uh, in the second uh, ten, uh, year period between 2010 and 2020, again, United States moved into, into what we call a high agglomeration area where um, basically both in terms of backward as well as forward uh, uh, from the backward and the forward perspective, uh, United States is starting to localize production and consumption of value added it creates, right? Um, uh, it could be possible because of the, uh, the changing geopolitical nature, uh, the changing nature of geopolitics, uh, the trade war, uh, and uh, technological changes and so on. Uh, but that's the only country that we had uh, uh, moving in that direction. Uh, China, uh, due to its own um, uh, economic policy, where they look more uh, into localizing production processes, they have been, this trend has been observed in China for long. And other than that, there's uh, not much uh, localization happening or when I say localization, it's uh, you know popular term would be reshoring or neoshoring happening in in many of these countries, in most of the countries. All right, now uh, to get to look at uh, other issues uh, such as supply chain uh, constraints issues that we are facing now, uh, we thought we would study the complexity of the production processes uh, and complexity of the global value chain networks. To do that, uh, what we uh, did was uh, we um, created what we know as the smile curve. Basically, the smile curve uh, maps out the entire production process related to a given country's uh, production sector or product or a firm's product or uh, production process. So, uh, looking at the a smile curve uh, from left to right. Uh, what you see in the left is basically uh, production processes uh, starting um, with research and development, uh, raw material that you need to produce to get, uh, to get the production processes moving, uh, manufacturing of parts and components and assembly, and then moving on to marketing and sales and after sales services and so on. So here what we see is, uh, the production processes at the left end uh, side, the left end, are likely to have more value adding because of the complexity and the knowledge, uh, technical know-how that is needed to produce these. And the uh, in the middle, when we reach the uh, the assembly and the low tech manufacturing and so on, the value adding, the, 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 these are low value adding activities. And then, uh, when we reach the uh, the marketing and sales activities, which is on the right hand side, right more uh, the right most uh, uh, part of the chart, uh, again those uh, what we see is that those activities are far more um, value adding. So, for example, uh, if you took Apple, uh, Apple would. Uh, make most of its money uh, in wholesale margin, as well as in R and D, right? So. Uh, 
So this chart depicts the value chain uh, for um, uh, uh, China's domestic uh, company firm. Uh, we also use the data to chart uh, the value chain for a multinational based in China. The chart it looks very similar. And uh, one of the points I want to uh, emphasize here is uh, just look at how complex the production process is, uh, how many, we, although we labeled only a few uh, country sectors, all these contribute to the production process of the multinational uh, company uh, based in China. So, so because of this complexity, uh, reshoring is not that easy. It cannot, uh, it cannot be done uh, in, a, in the short to medium term. And it has to have a very, um, uh, it has to have like an economic benefit, a very defined, uh, a significant economic benefit to reshore uh, production processes. Right? And uh, for a country like uh, China, it makes uh, sense to attract and localize uh, some of the high value adding processes because the more you add these uh, high value adding processes uh, and localize the high value adding processes, uh, it increases your income and GDP and so on. But we, when we look at the uh, similar, when we do the the, the smile curve, uh, the chart for a US-based company. What we see is the what we see is the sort of the opposite. The the manufacturing process uh, that is taking place in the United States is the highest value adding. That's probably because of the the complexity of the production process and the technical know and the technical know how required to basically produce that product. And all the raw materials that need to produce that have to come from multiple uh, uh, other locations. And then uh, after this being uh, produced, it gets shipped to uh, various locations around the world. But uh, what you can see is um, if, even if one of these uh, uh, contributors have a problem, uh, such as the one that we are facing now due to the, uh, you know, the, uh, the supply chain uh, snags. The entire process can be uh, affected, right? And so these are, uh, and, it, and, and this, because of the, um, the, the way the supply chain is, uh, supply chains are structured and, and uh, distributed around the world, there's not much, uh, there in terms of uh, you know uh, extra facilities or substitutability or anything like that so if uh, one of the suppliers run into a problem it'll be, it'll be very hard to find another supplier simply because firms try to maximize uh, profit and minimize cost by uh, by sticking to a very a lean production process and uh, the this one uh, again uh, with such the same chart. Uh, so the, the previous chart is for a U.S. based company. Uh, the second chart is for a multinational company uh, based in United States. Again, uh, so what I would like, another point I would like to, to reiterate is it really for a U.S. based company it really does not make much economic sense to try and. Um, uh, reshore its production processes because uh, many of these uh, production processes are lower, on an average, lower value adding than the, pro, uh, the, the processes that are in the United States. So if you uh, have to reshore, you'll actually have to pay more. Uh, so it does not make uh, economic sense. Um, again, uh, this is uh, another interesting chart uh, for a multinational company based in the United States. So what this shows is a multinational company based in uh, having a shop or a factory in the United States. It is essentially producing a very high value adding, a high, uh, highly complex products because in the United States, um, so the, it's the, the intermediate inputs coming from outside uh, and also the, the production processes subsequent to the uh, assembly are all high value adding. And, in, and plus the manufacturing and assembly 
uh, that's taking place in the United States is also high value adding. So this essentially is a value chain for a highly complex product. So, um, so for firms to uh, localize production processes in the United States, uh, certainly the production, so the, the product itself has to be highly complex. Uh, I believe recently uh, uh, Samsung decided to open a, a manufacturing facility in the United States uh, uh, simply because of the fact that it is a high value adding product. Now, uh, so moving forward to the risks uh, that uh, global value chain is uh, facing. So we talked about uh, uh, the trade war uh, in a, and there are a number of studies out there, uh, both uh, by ADB as well as IMF and a number of organizations, which showed that um, the trade war resulted in uh, China's GDP uh, going down by about 1% and United States GDP by about 0.25% if uh, all the tariffs are, tariff impositions are implemented uh, as, as planned. Um, now, uh, we also looked at the impact of COVID and uh, and how GVC participation could have affected the uh, impact of COVID itself. So what we had done was to try to correlate the GVC participation rate of uh, 62 uh, countries that we have in our database with the, the change in the... Uh, the GDP. So basically, the change in the GDP is essentially the the focus GDP forecasted for 2020 by IMF, and the that so and the the actual GDP. So the difference between the two, and we try to map it out. And so what we have seen is uh, again. This is for economists to take it uh, further and researching into why this we are getting a, this kind of pattern. It might very well be due to the type of value chain these countries are participating in. Uh, so for some countries uh, who have um, lower GVC participation, uh, the GVC, lower GVC participation uh, seem to have helped in uh, sort of mitigating the impact of uh, COVID. Uh, but for other group of countries, uh, the higher GVC participation seemed to have helped to mitigate uh, the impact of COVID. But then there is a third group of countries which are, uh, you know, we, as we approach a GVC participation rate about 45, 50%, they seem to have been more affected uh, because of their GVC participation. So uh, overall, uh, what we see on a, at a global average is uh, GVC participation seemed to have on an average uh, amplified the negative effect of uh, uh, COVID uh, in terms of uh, GDP lost. Moving forward, um, in the report, we looked at uh, multiple factors. Uh, one is uh, the, in terms of risks, one is uh, the trade conflict, the geopolitical issues, and then the finally the, the COVID. So we tried to uh, map it out uh, in terms of um, imports uh, from China uh, to various countries. Um, so what we see is a, as a cumulative effect, um, the imports uh, from China dropped uh, uh, in, in United States as well as Europe, but pretty much uh, held out uh, uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, so it's it's possible this may very well have been affected by the uh, much more by the trade war than by COVID itself, uh, because it, the decline started in 2018. And then uh, we look at uh, by the, the the trade in terms of the complexity of uh, the GVC that they part countries participate in. An interesting trend that we see here is that when you look at only the complex GVCs, the imports um, of uh, United States uh, from China were affected by the. The, the trade conflict, but then seem to have sort of picked up uh, 
around the time COVID hit. Uh, it may have been due to the fact that a lot of technological, uh, to technologically complex uh, equipments uh, had to be uh, assembled and imported in short notice to uh, deal with the uh, the new working environment related to COVID. Yeah. And then again, uh, we, when we look at simple GVCs, obviously uh, it is uh, easy to substitute uh, the products that can be imported. Uh, right? uh, and uh, so, uh, so we see a drop uh, in the uh, imports from China uh, to United States. Uh, but for other countries, uh, it didn't really change much. Uh, but the, but as we hit COVID, yes, we see some drop. Uh, one interesting thing is that uh, as we look at the um, PRC's share of total US GVC related imports, it actually went up uh, during uh, 2020, uh, in spite of all the issues that we uh, looked at geopolitical uh, trade war and COVID and so on. So this may have been due to the additional import requirements needed to produce highly complex um, or technologically complex products. So um, moving forward, um, so in this report, we covered various factors, various issues, but uh, we I presented only the trends and uh, that we uh, studied over the 25 uh, year, uh, year period. And also some issues that we um, uh, wanted to address as a result of the current environment. However, the report covers various uh, uh, phenomena and factors and issues that affect co the, the global value chain phenomena, uh, such as productivity, uh, intellectual properties, uh, services, servitization, digitalization, uh, and so on. So uh, I encourage you to uh, please read the report and uh, contact us uh, for uh, any questions, explanations, and comments you may have. Uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I'm uh, open for any questions. Thank you. Excuse me, Joseph, thank you very much. Um, really very interesting. The statistics appear to tell some really important stories, not just about um, global value chains, but also about geopolitics. Um, we, the, the, the Asian studies program here at Georgetown um, pushes the students, including in exams next week, to um, explain the intersection of, um, of, of economic trends and uh, trade and investment statistics and uh, uh, geopolitical rivalry. Um, and Asia is a region which is exciting for scholars if nerve-wracking nerve -wracking for business leaders because both geopolitical rivalry and economic interdependence live side by side. Um, and we often ask the students, uh, which do you think will win? And the students who want to go work in the Pentagon say geopolitics will prevail and, prevail, and the students who want to go work in the ADB or Microsoft say economics will prevail. Um, I, I, um, I want to uh, go from the correlation and push a little more on the speculation about causality in this connection between geopolitics and the global value chain uh, statistics you showed us. I, I think I see some important impacts. Um, it seems to me that the, um, the increase in uh, global value chain um, until, around two, until COVID um, really does closely correlate to a growth in regional trade agreements. And just Japan, which I know best alone in that period, went from having about 16% of its trade covered by EPAs and FDAs in around 2012-13 to about 85% today. So huge, within Asia, huge moves. And that's important for the US because if we keep sitting out of CPTPP, there's a, an obvious consequence in the numbers you show. I'm struck that the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, doesn't seem to have a significant impact. The countries where BRI is, um, most important as a percentage of uh, GDP would be Laos and Cambodia, and there's where you see some correlation. Um, and I'm especially struck by the um, high agglomeration uh, that you show for the US and China, and, and with the exception of perhaps Vietnam, quite low for the rest of the region. To me, what that says is we have a story now of intense decoupling between the US and Chinese economies the recent uptick notwithstanding. But for the rest of the region, it's not fundamentally changing the, the aggregate global value chain picture. 
Um, and some countries like Vietnam are benefiting because of, um, you know, it's not just about reshoring back to the US or Japan, it's about Samsung and, and NEC shifting to Vietnam. So those are some impressions. I'd be interested if you think I got that wrong. I'd also be interested if you could tell us um, what, you know, if you're allowed to speculate, what do you think this report will look like next year? What, 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 which trends do you think are gonna, you know, we won't hold you to it, um, but what, what do you expect next? And then finally, um, we do have a question from Mr. Masuda, who I'm gonna give you all the questions since time is short, you can answer any you like in, in the conclusion. Uh, question specifically about the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, USMCA. Going forward, do you think that's going to really um, enhance uh, the regional concentration within North America? Um, and, uh, and then a question from Professor Wagner, which is, um, uh, in addition to statistical analysis, are there other methods, social science methods, you'd like to have scholars use um, to try to interpret the data further? So that's a lot, Joseph, but we only have about four minutes. So pick and choose what you like, and, um, and then we'll wrap up. Really interesting. And I look forward to reading the report, report in detail. O over to you, Joseph. Thank you. Uh, to the uh, first question, uh, in the long run, economics wins, uh, <laughs> because over thousands of years of trade, the trade has triumphed all sorts of barriers. Uh, so in the long run, uh, uh, economics will win, uh, because uh, essentially follow the money. Yeah. Uh, the, in terms of the new uh, the NAFTA 2, um, once again, uh, it will depend on how well it serves the, the economics of it. Uh, so if there is uh, unrealized benefits, uh, economic benefits that uh, this can unlock uh, certainly, uh, but um, so hopefully uh, this has, um, you know, this is opening things up further, probably for countries like Mexico, for migration of labor and uh, uh, transfer of technology and so on. Uh, but uh, it should also help uh, to integrate further with other regions uh, as well. Uh, so because uh, just within this region itself, uh, we may have already maximized the benefits. Um, for the, the third question related to socio, uh, social methods, um, uh, I, I am not sure. I, am, uh, I have always focused on economic statistics. Uh, however, uh, it would help to have, uh, for example, in the current times, to have <clears throat> a, a better uh, healthcare system, uh, uh, you know the worker um, protection and and so on, which uh, will help to keep the production processes moving uh, in 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 such times, and and also a better healthcare for you know workers across countries and so on. Yeah. Thank you. I think the last question was um, about social science methods. Um, uh, but 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 I'll 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 answer that one as we conclude. I think, um, you know, when I was a grad student, I'll be honest, Joseph. I feared statistics. I was much more comfortable with history and languages and in theory. But uh, this is really really uh, interesting and useful. And uh, if you were to do an interdisciplinary next step with this data, I'd be very interested in some scholar looking at some of these. Um, trends in the global value chain, the impacts of geopolitics, that correlation, and then looking at other periods. Because in the long run, economics does win. But in the middle, you sometimes have, sometimes have things like World War I and World War II. So it'd be interesting to look at how, um, in a historical comparative perspective, these kind of statistics looked. And, and you can get them uh, in 1914 and the 1930s. And um, history rhymes, it doesn't repeat. But there are some patterns here that are quite, quite interesting. Um, on the whole, I find it reassuring, actually, because um, what it says is that the U.S.-China decoupling, which is quite deliberate by both sides in the tech sector, uh, primarily, is not um, in itself damaging development in Asia. Um, and that's, that's important because stability in this region depends not just on the choices of the U.S. and China, but 
in a very fundamental way on the success of developing Asia. Because if developing Asia is prosperous and secure, there, 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 there are no security vacuums and there's no reason to fight about influence. So on the whole, Joseph and colleagues at the ADB, I come away quite encouraged uh, in a period of intense geopolitics. So I want to thank um, uh, uh, M. Joseph Mariangsingham and Leslie and colleagues at the ADB and uh, Joey Gonzalez at Georgetown. Thank you. Um, we'll wrap up here. I look forward to the next report. All the best. Thank you very much.